Hello, Buddhist geeks, and welcome to Enlightenment Engineers Part Three. I'm Kelly Sosan Bear, and today I am joined with, uh, joined by Emily Horn and Kenneth Folk. And today we have um, a fun episode where we're going to open it up to the community to take live questions and answers. And the way that you can submit your question is by just popping it into the question section on our Enlightenment Engineers event page, and we'll receive those. Um, via our Google Plus Q&A app. And f one thing I wanted to mention is that if you really like a question or you're really interested in a question or really just want to hear the answer to a question, feel free to plus one that question and that will elevate it and give it a higher ranking in our um, Q&A queue and we will pull the most popular questions first, of course. Yeah. Um, so with that, I'd just like to jump right in and start. We've already got a few questions here. Um, the first one is, how can enlightened people do unenlightened actions? Hmm. <laughs> you want to take a swing at that. <laughs> well, that that's easily going to fill up the, the hour. Yeah. <laughs> or, or we could uh, we could kind of uh, circle around behind it and and ask what the assumptions are of the mm -hmm. question. So the assumption is that we know the definition of of enlightenment and we agree on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very unlikely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, if you if you define enlightenment as now, so, let's see. If you define an enlightened person as someone who could never do an enlightened action, an unenlightened action. Um, all right. Now that's too complicated. <laughs> I want to make this real. I want to make this more simple. Mm. What if? What if? what you think enlightenment is isn't what it is. Yeah. So remember that scene in, in The Princess Bride where, where that one guy keep, keeps saying, inconceivable, <laughs> and the giant is, is climbing up the rope and he's going to catch us, inconceivable. And, and the, the other guy turns to him and says, you use that, a word, use that word a lot. I don't think you know what that word means. Or maybe it means something you don't think it means. So maybe enlightenment means something that we don't think it means, or whoever, if we ask ourselves these questions that, that get us into these circular conundrums, mm -hmm. uh, maybe there is no such thing as this, this magical enlightenment that uh, results in never doing anything that anybody would disapprove of. Yeah, I think that's really important when we consider this because um, yeah, I was talking briefly with Kelly this morning, so Kelly, you can jump in around this too, about different lines of development, and um, do you want to take it, Kelly, about... Um, oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. How the spiritual line is just one line. Yeah, so with this question, you obviously have to back up a few steps here. What is enlightenment? What is it to you? Do your peers agree? <laughs> um, <laughs> And for me, you know, just if I were to simply define enlightenment in the context of this question, I would go about it um, in a very simple way, um, using kind of emotional intelligence as an example. So emotional intelligence is an example of a line of development. It's the emotional line, and that line evolves through stages, developmentally speaking. Um, so if we apply that to the spiritual line of development, looking at the highest stage of that line, I would, in this context, define that as enlightenment. But I would not take the highest stage of the spiritual line and apply that over to, let's say, the moral line or the kinesthetic line or even the cognitive line. So that an unenlightened person, an enlightened person can be enlightened, fully evolved in the spiritual line, but when it comes to actions or morals or ethics, be very underdeveloped or not as developed or not developed to the same point as they are in the spiritual line then causing um, a dissonance in their developmental lines so I don't know if this is too complex but basically being the highest stage in the spiritual line does not necessarily mean you're going to be an awesome person in the world mm -hmm. okay <laughs> that, that, so that's a good I think that's a good setup uh, mm -hmm. and so riffing off of that Kelly uh, Let's see. There's something that we do in the in the realm of spirituality that we don't do pretty much anywhere else when we talk about what humans are capable of. So let me give an example that I think will illustrate this. 
if if you were to uh, posit a, a category of human called the best basketball players in the world, the best shooters in the world, uh, well, then if we want to look at what really happens in, in the real world, the best basketball shooters in the world miss about half the time. They miss about half the time. If you want to talk about baseball players, uh, batters, uh, the best in the world miss about 60% of the time or more, 60 to 70% of the time. Uh, but because we have so much data, it's so, it's so easy to count how many times you make it, how many times you shoot, and how many times it goes in the basket. It's easy to count how many times you swing or, uh, and how many times you hit it, hit the ball. Um, reality testing is, is easy to do there. And I suppose because reality testing is easy there, we uh, are willing to just accept that uh, human excellence exists within the constraints of human biology and, and physics and, and human psychology. There are constraints. But somehow, when we get into spirituality, when we start talking about enlightenment, we imagine there should be some kind of spiritual perfection mm -hmm. where it, the people don't miss half the time. They, they get it right every single time. And I'm saying that isn't true. That's completely unrealistic. Humans don't work that way. And so if you want to talk about what would be the, re the reality of, of the, the, the epitome of human excellence in, in the realm of spirituality, they're probably going to miss about half the time. Now, if you recalibrate your understanding of what enlightenment is, given what Kelly just said, that we're not actually talking about, um, even not, might not even be talking about impeccable ethical behavior, and we might not even ta be talking about, um, about the ideal of emotional intelligence, uh, we might be talking about some kind of spirituality that uh, has yet to be defined in this conversation, even so, you're going to miss half the time. Mm -hmm. Now what? Yeah, it brings up um, a little bit what comes to mind is the spiritual, you know, the spiritual bypassing concept of, um, you know, we can continue to grow and develop in our contemplative path, and then at the same time, like there is our personalities and there are um, things that we need to continue to work on in our psyche, which um, Kenneth, you alluded to too. So. Yeah, I think that's important because, and especially with the perfection ideal, it runs so prevalent in our culture that that in itself is something that we really have to deconstruct because underneath it, it's it's actually quite painful. Um, any kind mm -hmm. of ideal like that, um, whether it's the ideal of what enlightenment should look like, or the perfect human, or the Adantas complex. I mean, we were just um, doing the video for the contemplative technology, and there, you know, we search for meditation images, and it's all like perfect you know, postured, chiseled men, you know, it's like, wait a minute, like what, what, it, it so easily seeps in that um, perfection um, ideal. So. Cool. I've been uh, looking at this, this idea of, uh, of Hercules. Yeah. Uh, Hercules was, was inf almost infinitely strong and basically invincible uh, but for some reason we don't talk about that much anymore we don't we don't train athletes nowadays by pointing to this ideal of perfection and saying look that's really a useful ideal for you to aspire to even though we know you're never going to get there because nobody ever has so we don't even talk about it and I think the reason we don't talk about it in training athletes is because it isn't an effective way to train athletes. A much more effective way is to, is to look at real people who, who really exist and are well documented and say, this is what they can do. These, these really fast runners, these milers can, can run a mile in a little under four minutes. If you can do that too, you'd be one of the best milers in the world. But, but nobody has ever run a three and a half minute mile. <clears throat> and nobody has ever run a zero minute mile. So, so for some reason, we never have these discussions. We don't say, well, if they're such good runners, how come they can't un outrun a horse? Because <laughs> humans don't un outrun horses. That's why. So, well, if people are so enlightened, how come they don't act like 
um, like uh, mythical god figures because humans don't act like like mythical god figures. Mythical god figures are imaginary. Yeah, so there's something about spiritual maturity that happens that like enlightenment can translate into action via some sort of spiritual maturing process is maybe how I would go about that. Um, mm -hmm. I would like to say you can have an enlightened view or come from an enlightened vantage point or have an enlightened perspective and com be a complete asshole in the everyday yeah. realm of your life. And but those two can, can coexist, it, you know, and it's a complete setup to think that they don't. And what it does is it actually creates a lot of disappointment because when we look to our teachers and we look to our authority figures and we look to that person that, you know, has the answer, when we do that thing, um, mm -hmm. we create a lot of suffering for both ourselves, others, and the community that we're in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and so this idea of, of maturity uh, that, that both of you have alluded to and, and, and this idea of um, realis realistic expectations uh, and growth, uh, on, on a developmental continuum there, there are places where you have to uh, kind of die to your to your fantasy illusions. So there's a, there's a a death of innocence and a coming of age every time you you realize, wow, I had it wrong. There there isn't a, there isn't a Hercules and there isn't a a perfect enlightened saint. Therefore, I'm not going to become a perfect enlightened saint uh, who behaves impeccably by everybody's standards. And that really is painful. There's a grieving process and. and, and it you know, makes my heart ache to think about how I've had to go through this, and other people uh, have to go through it. And once you do uh, face up to it and and have this death of innocence and coming of age, uh, you get you 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 become freer. You become free of this illusory notion of perfection. Mm -hmm. You no longer have to beat yourself up because you're not perfect. Of course you're not perfect. That's easy to accept if you didn't expect a perfect was possible. And the people around you don't have to suffer the, the cruel abuse of your expectations that they should be perfect. It's a very compassionate act to realize that you are simply wrong about what you think enlightenment is. And to know that you're just simply human at the same time. All right, we got a lot of questions <laughs> coming in. This is awesome. Um, so if we're feeling complete on that, I'm going to move to uh, to another one okay. here. Um, let's see. All right, this is a doozy. Ready? <laughs> Is there a highest stage in the enlightenment line, or is there, or is there always further to go? And once you've developed to a particular level, do you always stay there? I would be tempted to to make some parallels with other kinds of human excellence. Mm. Is there a highest stage in um, in basketball playing excellence? Um, not really. I mean, there are, there, are, there are all these different people <clears throat> that, who are all different, and they'll have their variations on excellence. And at the same time, there kind of is a place beyond no, which nobody has gone yet. I mean, nobody's shooting 60 and 70 percent hoops. Uh, even the best in the world are lucky to get 50 percent. Uh, I realize that's 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 disappointing. That's a crushing blow if, if we're talking <laughs> about enlightenment, because we uh, because we might be saying that there's some kind of a I don't want to say a hard ceiling, but some kind of a um, a practical ceiling on what people are capable of at this time. Mm -hmm. Now there will always be uh, be people who are particularly gifted. People are sometimes known as as geniuses. So you can say you might say. Well, the, the Buddha, the historical Buddha, was was a, a genius. Maybe he was a, a spiritual genius. Uh, and, and you might name some other figures, maybe even some from our own time. 
I'm like, okay, fair enough. Some people are, are really talented. Uh, and at the same time, um, we're still talking about the constraints of human biology and psychology. So I, it, it's not that, that you get to some static, uh, uh, persistent cosmic bliss out and then just camp out there for the rest of your life. I mean, I think, I think Buddhism explicitly um, debunks that. Uh, so it, it, uh, let, me, uh, let me be more specific. What do I think enlightenment is? Mm -hmm. I think enlightenment is the ability to see experience as process in real time. So everything is seen as process, including the momentarily arising sense that it's happening to me. Uh, and from that point of view, there, there's a tremendous amount of freedom. I think it's a, it's a much better way to live, in, in my experience, than, than what I would consider the less enlightened view, which is that there's a static, um, there's somebody in here who's doing all of this. Uh, I might even make the case that, that being able to see enlightenment as, or rather experience as process is better than um, the cartoon saint, what I call the cartoon saint model of enlightenment because it allows you to uh, not only have, have the exquisite highs of the cosmic bliss up, but also to experience the painful lows of, of anger and momentary despair. Uh, I actually think that's good. I, I, it's, a, it's an ideal for me to be able to experience the whole broad range of, of human experience and be okay with that. So for me, where enlightenment goes, if you were just to describe what it feels like, it feels like meta-okayness. Meta-okayness. It, it's okay even not when it's okay when it's not okay. So mm -hmm. for me, that's as good as it gets. Uh, and that's completely dynamic <clears throat> because process is dynamic. There isn't any place where that sticks, where that, that hangs up. Well, yeah. Like yeah. It. Oh, please. Yeah. I think it alluded to, I, I hear it in what you're saying a little bit, of the um, paradox that we move into of um, there's the process, for me my experience is the process part and then there's also through shifts of the contemplative path um, a grounding and the groundlessness that um, I guess you describe it Kenneth as the meta okayness. Um, so it's almost like this question's a little, I mean, of course, these questions are tricky to me. Um, at the same time, it's, um, you know, the four-minute mile wasn't possible at a certain point, and then somebody passed that barrier, and then it's possible for a lot of people. So in that sense, the evolutionary part of um, the contemplative path is um, continuous. And then at the same moment, it, there is a possibility to tap into this, I don't know how, it's like a body feeling to me of a timelessness um, that I, I question if that if that's changeless or, or 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 what what that necessarily is like maybe some people would allude to Buddha nature here um, does that is that an innate um, quality that is is um, is changing um, that that's a question for me yeah is Buddha nature the same uh, in the 1900s as it is right now in 2013 mm-hmm that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. That, that's. I think that's a great. That's a great exploration. So then we would have to ask: Is Buddha nature? Um, is it? A, is it an, an experience? And I yeah, would say, of I would course, know. it's an experience. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, that's because I otherwise, would. nobody would be talking about it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and if it's not an experience, that's and it's a, yeah. Then it's just if it's not an experience, it's just mm -hmm. a concept, and then and then you can define it any way you want to, and you can agree on it or not. Mm -hmm. But if it's an experience, then I think it's fair to say that every experience uh, that any human being has has neural correlates. In other words, there's there's some corresponding uh, functioning in the brain that uh, that directly corresponds to that experience. So since my brain isn't exactly like Emily's brain or like Kelly's brain, if I say, oh, I have this experience of Buddha nature, is that exactly what Emily experiences? I don't know. If I, if I have a stroke in the very part of my brain that, that, that mm -hmm. corresponds to Buddha nature, um, am I going to have access to that same experience? So I guess one of the things that I want to say yeah. is 
I want to take all of this. Uh, I want to be able to talk about all of this without, without uh, having to resort to magical thinking or mythical thinking. I don't want to have to kind of wave the magic wand and say, "Wait, we're not going to talk about. <clears throat> we're not going to talk about brain chemistry anymore. We're going to talk about the magic thing that could happen even to a disembodied spirit." To me, that that's just nonsense. I don't think we have to do that at all. I would like to to uh, move the discussion of of awakening and, and enlightenment to uh, to a place that doesn't preclude talking about biology uh, mm -hmm. or or brain science, and I think that will work fine. I, I know that we'd be giving up something, or or giving up our our, our magical romantic notions. Yeah, I think what something. I would add there is just as long as it doesn't um, move into the place of solidity, a solidifying around um, science, you know, because a scientist, like a real scientist would say, okay, well, there's always that mystery, there's always that room for things to move and change. Um, so I guess that's just my own personal um, feeling around it, that um, the mystery is, is pervasive, um, and as long as we can hold that along with the brain science and along with some of these other um, demystifying enlightenment. Um, I think it's great. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you, Emily. I think that a good science <clears throat> doesn't pretend to know everything, and yeah. it doesn't um, it doesn't ever rule out mystery. That would be that would yeah. be bad science. So we, we don't want to fall over into scientism, which is a kind of hardened religion of science. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and just to bring it back to the question real quick, um, I just wanted to say just a few things on the Enlightenment line and, and kind of put out the frame to try out and maybe hold and see what it's like for folks to hold Enlightenment as kind of like a sliding scale. So like mm -hmm. a sliding scale of Enlightenment or a line of development that has a sliding scale and you can fall within this range, but that it's actually evolutionary and it has directionality and it has this ascension to it. And so it's never really complete. And there is, you know, there are people that have taken it to the farthest that they can go. And those boundaries and goals or glass ceilings can be broken, as we've, you know, seen in other examples, even talked about today. Um, and yes, you can always get stuck at a certain level of development. Your development can stall. You can do things to sabotage your development. Um, if you're not actively engaged in pushing the boundaries of your development, it's probably going to be harder to move in the direction that you want on that sliding scale. Um, I believe, what, I don't know exact data on this, but it's something like at the age of like 22, 23, the human, the human actually stops developing unless you're consciously engaging some kind of practices to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to bring that, bring that out too, just to give a more concrete <laughs> answer to that question if that's helpful to Naomi. Um, all right. Wow, we've got we've got some more here. <laughs> um, all right. Next question. It's got plus seven on it. <laughs> um, again, another interesting question here. Um, for those here who are enlightened, <laughs> how do you know you are enlightened? What does it feel like? Hmm. Feels regular. Yeah. So, so of course, the, there again. It goes, I can't even answer this question. <laughs> I know. I, 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 like, I feel like the deer in the headlights. I'm like. Oh. <laughs> the first thing that has to happen is. It's is like I don't even identify like of that. enlightenment. Yeah, exactly. Um, every, I think everybody in the audience will have a different understanding of what enlightenment is, and probably by most of those definitions, I, I would not consider myself to be enlightened. Right. So, if mm -hmm. if enlightenment is the cartoon saint. That's not me. If enlightenment is a person who never, um, uh, never does anything that annoys anybody, it's certainly not me. So, by my definition of enlightenment, um, lots of people I know, including me, uh, have it. So, this is this ability to to experience, uh, to have to see experience as process in real time. And as Kelly said, that's a sliding scale. So. Uh, you can see experience 
as process once in a great while, which basically the first time it happens is a huge life-changing event for most people. Or you can see it that way most of the time. But it doesn't mean you won't be up and down, kind of more and less enlightened throughout the day. And I also think that on that developmental continuum, you can identify some landmarks. You can get to a point where you say, I really got what I came for. I, uh, my whole life I'm trying to understand what, where this process goes, where this, this um, development goes, and feeling like there's something undone. I'm moving towards something, understanding something, but it hasn't yet, those shapes haven't yet emerged from the mist. And at some point, it's possible to, to have some kind of a breakthrough. And presumably, something changes in your brain. Maybe there's a, 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 it's a perceptual shift, I would say to have greater perceptual resolution, um, both in a temporal and in a spatial sense. You know, I, I won't go into so much into that right now, but just you see things differently. And so at that point, you might say, wow, I think I am enlightened. I think I really get what the, the, the real fruit of this development is. And I think I understand what the old-time enlightenment people were talking about. So leaving aside all of mythology and hyperbole about how perfect they were, maybe they were talking about something real, some kind of human experience. Um, and yeah, I think I think I relate to that. So so suddenly enlightenment isn't this phony, lofty thing that nobody gets except except cartoon saints from from the days of yore. So suddenly enlightenment is something really doable, something you can do and something that you uh, people you know are doing for me that's just so much better than than the uh, cartoon saint version and what it feels like <clears throat> now that I've said what I mean by enlightenment <laughs> um, it feels like meta okayness it feels like life is in interesting and engaging and and okay uh, so there's this this kind of equanimity, a very robust equanimity, even when it's not okay. So even uh, sometimes, sometimes I'm completely aversive and and think um, I hate this, I want out, whatever whatever is happening at that moment. And then that's okay. Uh, sometimes I'm I'm completely ecstatic and and loving life and everybody and, and feeling compassion for everybody on the planet, and and that too is okay. At the same time, it isn't that there's something standing apart from it over here, some little enlightened voyeur watching, saying, <laughs> it's okay, it's okay, it's not that. It, it, uh, even that would be something that's just rolled into the experience. It's just that in any given moment, if you kind of look around, even in your moments of, of anger and, and uh, aversion, if you kind of look around um, and take stock, you can see that, yeah, it totally sucks. In a sense, it's not okay at all. And yet, it's okay. It's okay. Mm, yeah. Yeah, that reminds me of um, another way of defining enlightenment that I like to say is um, being free from the exclusive identification of ego. Mm -hmm. and, and so what does that feel like? Um, well, depending on the sliding scale, again, how, dis how not exclusively identified you are versus how much you are. Um, there's just more room. You know, you just actually have more room, more room to breathe, more room to process, more room to deal with shit, more room to not react. <laughs> um, there just feels like a, a quality of more spaciousness. Um, and I just like that, another definition of the not being exclusively identified to ego. I think that might be a helpful way to frame it up, too. I like that because it doesn't say that you don't have any access ever to this, to the uh, to the sense that this is happening to me. Frankly, mm -hmm. I think you'd be dysfunctional if you had that. You'd be a vegetable. Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to tell yourself the difference between yourself and a sponge. But yeah, you'd be locked <laughs> up or somewhere. <laughs> right, but the way you psychotic. said it, <laughs> right, you're, so you're at least free from the exclusive identification as, as an individual. Mm -hmm. I like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would follow up with that. Basically what you guys were saying is that um, for me, there's a there's a feeling of connection that I didn't sense before I started really practicing really um, deeply. That because like Kenneth was talking about, it's kind of always felt like it was outside, and I was trying to get somewhere, or go somewhere, and like striving, striving. And that sense of striving has 
has really, really changed. I, I can't think, I don't feel like the hamster on the wheel necessarily anymore. Um, and the sense of connection to something that um, Kelly was alluding to, like the spaciousness, the more room, um, is definitely prevalent um, for sure. And uh, for me, the, now, like, there's been a huge process in this, and um, and now it seems to be, because even after some of the shifts that we talk about in the contemplative path, like, there's been such a um, huge amount of integration for me, and I think with just everyone has to go through, um, even after um, the enlightenment process, it's like um, there's been so much integration uh, that hasn't always been joyful, and now it's it's very much more luminous um, for me, and there's a lot, a lot more joy. Um, so I wanted to bring in that as well. Mm. Nice. Yeah, I like the, the luminous joy piece that sometimes yeah. we forget. <laughs> yeah. We forget sometimes the joy. Yeah. Even yeah. when it's not joyous. Yeah. Um, awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap it up on that question and move on to the next one here. I'm doing pretty good. Um, all right. Here's the next question from John. Is enlightenment one thing? If not, then how do you pick what to do? Exercise example. I know that the outcomes of training for a, I know what the outcomes are for training for a 5K, and I know the outcomes of training for a marathon. So can I pick or try them out and see which one I like best? So essentially, if enlightenment isn't one thing, how do you know what to do? How do you know what practice to do, to engage? What path to even embark upon? I think it's a great question because it because it uh, mm -hmm. raises the possibility of um, being of conscious intention. Uh, uh, are we having uh, technical difficulties? Okay, no, we're still I think we're good. Okay, um, yeah. It takes it out of this. Uh, it takes it away from the idea that there that it only goes one place and and. Uh, if you just meditate enough, everybody will come to this one thing, whatever it is. It's generally considered to be some um, fantasy of, of a cosmic bliss out. But but if we if we acknowledge that, like sports, uh, you can train in various ways. You you do specific exercises that lead to to specific results. Um, that's really interesting. Uh, it, with sports, it's much easier to see what those results are. So there, ha there really hasn't been enough research uh, with with enlightenment, with contemplative practices, to know exactly what the various threads are. Mm -hmm. But but certainly we could talk about you could get really good at concentration and entering altered states, and you could um, and that's a particular kind of meditation practice that leads to that kind of concentration. Well, that's one thing you could do. You could get really good at my favorite metric, which is seeing experience as process. And I have a, a, a sense of what practices lead most effectively to that. And I'm constantly refining that based on experience and observation. And, and I can imagine there would be several other um, things that you might want to be good at. Maybe you want to be good at... Uh, radiating loving-kindness to everyone. Well, there are specific practices for that. So, so the answer, my answer to the first question, is enlightenment one thing? No. In the same way that nothing human is one thing. <laughs> yeah. And, and the, the second one, um, find somebody who seems to, to um, be a good example of whatever it is you want to develop and and d do that person's practice and, and see where it goes. Now, just like sports, you're not stuck with one thing. You can say, well, I want to really develop my concentration by practicing with Pao Aok Sayadaw, the, the jhana master, for a year or two or three uh, and see if I can get really good at that. Good. And then and you, and you do. And you say, oh, it's, it's like being really good at running a mile. So now I'd like to try something else. So now I want to practice with some, somebody who does X and somebody who does Y. There are all these uh, specialties, ways to be excellent, and there are targeted practices that lead to those things. Yeah, so it's like needing to know what type of excellence you want will then help you figure out which practice to engage. 
Yeah, and I would say, um, I'll bring a little bit different angle, maybe maybe this is a different angle, I'm not sure. Um, for me, and I've seen this working with um, other women, it's like, and not just women, um, but there's a contemplative heart part of it. Like, I would say, like, our hearts know how, like, our hearts know what we need. Like, if we can really drop into our heart center and if we really can get in touch with, like, this moment, which is part of what we're training to do. And at the same time, we can, we, we can gravitate. It's like, you know, the, the fly is going towards the light, you know. It's like we can gravitate towards um, that natural opening of our hearts and our minds because that's ultimately, you know, and that's who we are. You know, we can unravel the misconceptions and the delusions and, the, and learn how our minds work, and that's the demystifying part of this process is that we can take um, an objective stance on this and at the same time trust that there is an innate quality to it. Um, so I would say um, that if we can, if you can get in touch with where you're drawn and what's calling you, that's one of the most important pieces I feel in this process. Um, and then the second thing is that our minds are really slippery. Um, like my teacher Trudy Goodman, she always says, you know, it's like the mind is like a thief. It likes to try to come in and steal your experiences. Um, <laughs> so it's like one of the tricky things I feel with. To saying, okay, you know, I'm going to do this loving kindness practice. Okay, well, now I'm going to do this Vipassana practice. Okay, now I'm going to do Zen. And now I'm going to do. It's like our minds are so slippery that we can form identifications around any of these practices. And when it gets difficult, it's so easy to jump back, jump, jump, jump. And so, really, as long as there's that deep intention and that heart longing and that willingness to sit in the fire with whatever practice you are choosing to do at that particular moment, um, that and and not you know and really question am I am I avoiding something by jumping over here to Zen or is this really my calling now um, is that really where my practice is, is opening um, and I feel like that's an important part of this too yeah the spiritual um, what I call the spiritual salad bar <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> nice all right another one down the hatch all right moving on to our next question from Zachary. Do you think that incorporating scientific study and secular practice could cause a sense of disenchantment among actual Buddhist practitioners? How do we study these effects of practice without becoming fixated on scientific materialism? Yeah, I think uh, it, it can cause a sense of disenchantment if it, if it starts to look so dry, and let me use an example uh, I think mindfulness-based stress reduction uh, can look really dry. Uh, the na even the name of it and, and the fact that it's all about stress reduction. And for those of us who are actually interested in, in awakening, we're going, stress reduction? <laughs> you're kidding. Oh, hum, yawn. Um, yet, I'm told by people who do that, who have done that practice, it's actually not dry. It's, it's um, pretty much straight up. Vipassana practice rebranded re in a way that allows it to be acceptable to hospitals and schools and prisons, which is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I completely relate to this, uh, to, to kind of taking the heart out of it by, mm -hmm. by making it so dry with, through scientific language. That's not a good thing. Uh, or let me say it another way. Good news, bad news, who knows? It might be a good thing if it causes us to really question uh, our attachment to the romance of it and to, and to being uh, just cultural Buddhists or, or religious Buddhists. I mean, I think being a cultural Buddhist or religious Buddhist, you know, fine, whatever floats your boat, but I personally don't have any interest in that. For me, the, the gem of Buddhism... Uh, is awakening and so the practices that lead to awakening are, are fascinating, endlessly fascinating and worth doing. Um, saying that it's worth doing is even understating the case. Uh, but for me, even if you were to take those whatever practices are leading to awakening, you completely strip away the Buddhism and just do those practices, that would still be good. That would, that would still be really juicy. 
So I, I guess I'm looking at the double-edged sword of um, of killing off our romantic notions about what Buddhism is. Mm -hmm. I don't have much to say in this one. I don't really either. I feel good. <laughs> yeah. All right, awesome. Well, thanks, Kenneth. <laughs> um, all right, next question. Is it possible to make the definition of, the enli of enlightenment so elastic that the Buddhist teachings lose some of their meaning? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, quick and dirty yes. <laughs> Emily, uh, can you talk about that? Um, well, I think the meaning, well, for, okay, this is what's coming to mind, and I'm not sure, we'll, we'll play around with it a little bit, but um, I'll use my personal experience with this, actually, because, um, so, I just, um, as some people know, I just started this um, teacher training, um, retreat teacher training, at Spirit Rock, and this last week that I spent there, we, we studied the Satipatthana Sutta, and we actually really, really got into the nitty-gritty of it, and previously to that, I had been teaching um, mindfulness, which kind of takes out most of it, not all of it, takes out the context of awakening. Um, so I thought that I was teaching the four foundations of mindfulness based on the Western interpretation of that, um, but then when I get into the textual, um, re like, the actual text of it, I see that there's so much that's left out, and um, so I feel like that kind of points to this question of, yes, if we broaden too far, um, we c it is possible to start to lose some of um, the aims of, the, of these practices. Mm -hmm. Does that kind of hit on what this is? Talking about maybe? Yeah, what I heard you say is basically um, with, with more span we lose depth. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, that's that's possible. I mean, I'm always looking for that point of like where depth and breadth meet each other, and I think that is an interesting point. Um, and I and I don't know exactly where that is yet, um, because I, it's not that mindfulness is wrong, and it's not like studying the Satipatthana in depth is right. You know, it's it's more like where are the where is the meeting place in our Western Buddhism? That's my question. It's like where's where's that meeting point um, where we can hold awakening um, and some of the original meaning, and at the same time open it up and demystify it, which I think is really, really important. Yeah, so it's dynamic. We're not, you're not saying, uh, you're not saying, well, whatever was written down in the, in the suttas is true, mm -hmm. and it all has to be um, preserved, even if it doesn't no. seem to have any value for us. Um, yeah. <clears throat> no, you're talking about a, a dynamic that's actually useful. And uh, so a metaphor I like, a parallel that I like here is, uh, is the mixed martial arts idea where you get people from various traditions in, in the ring and they fight and you start to see what actually is an effective martial arts if the objective is to win the fight. That's, that's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, th there's more than one objective with these things. So, for example, in Kung Fu, they, people, there are all these really beautiful flowing motions all these dance moves, basically, uh, which have no value in winning a fight. And how do I know that? Because because we've seen it again and again in, in mixed martial arts. You put people in the ring, and people who do dance moves just get punched and knocked down. Uh, so you don't see any dance moves anymore in, in mixed martial arts. That's useful information. Now, does that mean that dance moves are useless? No. Dance moves are awesome. It's beautiful to see people doing traditional kung fu. Just don't bring that to a fight if you want to win. So as long as we can identify what we're after, we don't really have to be um, uh, derisive about certain things that don't work for one, uh, for, for one goal because they might work for some other goal. 
and having said that, it's just nice to be. It's nice to know what your goal is. It's nice to be clear about what your goal is. So for me, because my goal is is, is awakening, as I define it, to be able to see process, um, I leave a lot out, and, and happily, I happily leave out uh, a lot of what I would consider to be hyperbole and, and fairy tales, and uh, and even certain. Um, I don't talk very much about the the uh, eightfold, the noble eightfold path. Mm -hmm. Uh, to the extent that it, it's an essential, to the extent that some aspects of it are 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 an essential or a useful scaffolding for the for the practices that train the brain to see uh, to, to change the perceptual threshold, then I would I would encourage people to do it. But if it's if it's basically just a beautiful religious tradition, I I, I don't emphasize it at all. Fair enough, yeah. The lean approach to practice, I like it. <laughs> All right. Um, let's go with this one here. Okay. This whole discussion of enlightenment feels dissociated from the present moment of our practice, whereas Kenneth has spoken about the process. Could all of you expand on what your feelings are about the process of awakening versus enlightenment? I, I know I kind of appreciated the silent the silence there for a minute. As a, I'm assuming that we're all checking into our mm -hmm. to our process. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that so I, I, if I get real time about it, what's the process? Uh, what am I experiencing? Itching, uh, yeah. aching, coolness, interest, agitation, uh, annoyance, amusement, engagement. Uh, I'm glad for this question because mm -hmm. because it is easy. It would be easy for us to get all up in our heads about this and and not pay attention to what's happening. But ultimately, ultimately. I think awakening is uh, it's about paying attention to what's happening. By the way, paying attention to what's happening even as you're having an intellectual discussion. Yeah. It's possible to allocate attention in that way. Yeah, part of my process has been um, to really feel to feel into the I've had to go through a process of learning to trust um, experience and trust the groundlessness of of what's happening in this moment, and and trust that okay, so whatever is going to emerge, it may land, it may not land, people may judge it, and there's all these responses to it. And at the same time, I'm able um, to really come into that being and becoming of um, life, I would say. And um, to me, that's where Kenneth was talking, like the engagement and then curiosity and um, sometimes there's agitation and sometimes whatever and then not even to have to necessarily consciously know moment to moment to moment to moment to moment to, oh this is sadness, this is anger, this is blah, blah, blah. just trust that this is such a process and such a fluidity of uh, experience that it, it can take care of itself and it is being, my experience is that it's being, it's being held and that, that just um, that's the embracing quality of it that I feel um, comfortable, and um, yeah. That's yeah, what Kenneth was referring to as meta okayness. Yeah. Um, even when the shit's hitting the fan, you're totally fine. I really like that. Yeah. I really like that. I resonate <laughs> with that. I do feel that. Um, sometimes I have to stretch to feel that, um, and tap into that and kind of radiate that out, especially in the most um, just insane, unexpected. Um, Things that come up in life that totally just rock your world, you know. Mm. And how do you relate to that? Um, and so relating to that as, as just to life in general as a process—that's what I really feel like awakening is—is mm -hmm. is just. And it's a process. <laughs> yeah, and it, for me, it's a process of embodiment. Um, I struggled for a while to to really feel grounded and okay. That meta okayness. Uh, for me, it was a little bit um, outside of, like, I, it was kind of, 
um, disassociated in a sense because I did so much hardcore practice that another part, even after things shifted um, and there was a connection quality of everything is okay, it didn't feel okay in my body and that was really disorienting for me. Um, so there has been a process of like that meta okayness even extending into my into my body. Like I can actually be fully here and it's okay and it's not just um, a feeling of meta okayness that's a little bit outside. Kind of abstracted, yeah. Abstracted, yeah. Yeah, again it goes to that space mm. of exclusively identifying with the ego or not. And when we identify with the ego, it's all about, am I okay, am I okay, am I safe, am I safe, am I loved? Yeah. <laughs> um, and when we get a little bit of room from that, you can then kind of tap into the, the deeper nature of the meta-okayness that Kenneth keeps bringing up. I just love that, that, um, mm -hmm. that frame. Yeah, I mean, it makes me think of something that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross said uh, in, the, in the 70s, I think. There was a, a kind of pop psychology movement called transactional analysis, mm -hmm. if I've got this right. And their, their slogan was, the slogan was, I'm okay, you're okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross quipped, I'm not okay, and you're not okay, and that's okay. So that's that's wisdom. So so sometimes so meta okayness doesn't mean I always feel good, and it doesn't mean uh, it, it doesn't even mean that I always am, ha fully feel it in my body, and that's okay. Okay, and on to our next and most likely our last question here. Does being enlightened automatically qualify one to teach? The answer likely being no. What are some desirable qualities when teaching being taught? Hmm. That's a good one. Uh, I think it's pretty much like everything else. You can be really good at something and be a terrible teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I once met in a, in a bar in LA, uh, I met one of my favorite bass players. I, I, was a, I was a musician at the time, I was a bass player too. And uh, I met one of my heroes, Rocco Prestia, who played with Tower of Power. And they were actually doing a gig at the bar at the time. So we, I, I saw him outside and I walked up, walked up to him and I, and I said, I, I introduced myself, um, I'm a big fan. Uh, uh, and we talked a little bit. He's very, he's a very friendly guy. Um, and I told him I take bass lessons here in Hollywood, and I pay—I don't remember what it was, like thirty-seven fifty for an hour, which was a lot of money at that time uh, in the late seventies, say early eighties. And uh, and he said, "Really?" He said, well, "Come over to my house, uh, in, uh, up in the valley. I'll, you give me thirty-seven fifty. I'll I'll teach you bass for an hour." And I thought, oh man, I'm not worthy. This guy's this guy's amazing. <laughs> so so I, I, I went to his apartment and, and I was I was stunned to see that this god of rock and roll had a regular apartment just like everybody else and a and a wife just like normal people. And uh, and so he he played a little, little bit for me and of course it was incredible. And then I, I'm okay, teach me something. But he didn't have any capacity, he didn't have any ability to teach anybody anything. He, he was he was just so gifted that he did it, but he didn't have the teacher gift. Mm -hmm. So Rocco, if you ever hear this, um, I'm still a big fan. Um, I'm telling the truth, you're not a teacher. All right, so, so there are two <laughs> different skills there. Uh, one is bass playing itself, and the other one is the skill of teaching. Mm -hmm. So what would be a really good uh, teacher for somebody who wants to learn uh, meditation and awakening? Somebody who is both a gifted teacher and uh, has skill with the content itself, meditation and awakening. Yeah, um, I think one thing to take into account when teaching, I don't, and I'm not even sure a lot of people who teach even study up on this, but it's just the the simple different learning styles that people engage in. You know, all the way, just you know, we have people that are more auditory and can hear something and learn that way. We have people that can't and can only learn in a visual kind of sense, in a visual representation, and then other people that are more kinesthetic learners and actually need to do it to learn it. And so to really account for learning styles in the teaching process I think is a huge um, benefit to, to bring into the spiritual realm. And just kind of bring some of that more educational learning styles into the realm of spirituality. 
I think that'd be helpful <laughs> as, as think be people huge. teach. <laughs> so yeah. that would be a, an example of a teacher who uh, ha who can spot the, the learning style of the student and and approach that student um, on the level that works. Mm -hmm. uh, another another approach would be to uh, get with a teacher who resonates with your learning style because not all teachers will have that skill that Kelly just mentioned. That's a, 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 another a special skill uh, within teaching to be able to recognize all those skills and adapt. Some people are just one-trick ponies. So if uh, yes. if, if we, you really just want to hear about um, awareness, uh, there are some teachers who are constantly are talking about awareness. And then you gravitate to that person for a while until you grow out of that and, uh, and then go get with somebody else. That talks about process of awareness. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it looks like um, we're just at the end of our time here. Um, so I think I'll close on questions. I just don't think we have enough time to authentically answer them as deeply as they needed. They would need to be in the time allotted. Um, so with that, I just want to thank you both. That was really fun. Um, and a very cool new yeah, process that we've done with the Buddhist Geeks community. This is the first time we've ever taken live questions on a show through this, this new Google Hangout uh, Q&A app, and I think so far, so good. I like this format a lot. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. Cool. Thank you, yeah. Emily. And thanks to everybody who yeah, asked thank questions. You all. Yeah, yeah, those are sure. great questions. Pleasure. Yeah. All right, well, you guys have a fabulous day, and um, we'll see you next time. Sounds Bye. good. Bye. Bye. Mm-hmm. <laughs>